I'm going to do all those things. Um, uh, and a, a big thanks to the presenters who've come before me. Aria Louise, you're so excited to be involved in that piece of work and that investment, especially about learning digitally as so much work goes digital. I know a lot of members um, are really keen to get that all, all working more smoothly. Um, and, and to Miranda, of course. Um, so I'm going to share slides and um, as I do, um, yeah, it's so lovely as well to see such a range of um, members and, and partners and actors in children and young people's lives here today. Um, and can someone give me a thumbs up if you've got the slides all right now? Great, thank you. Um, and yeah, so I just wanted to take this opportunity to share a few things that are in the frame for us in Cork. Um, and as uh, Nick says, always hoping that it's going to in encourage other people to dialogue with us and join, join the conversations and, and help us shape that work. Um, and as I go through today, I am going to touch on a number of the things that are going to be explored more fully in the focused sessions. And I hope I'm not, I'm pretty sure I'm not stealing anyone's thunder too much. Um, and that those will be, be really rich conversations, but hopefully it's an encouragement for people to come back to things if I know you've had to make choices about those parallel sessions, but and perhaps to dig into the slides um, and bits from sessions you might, might have missed or, or to catch up um, with us afterwards. Um, so just, I suppose, first of all, for those of you who might be only familiar with one aspect of, of Cork's work, a, a brief refresh on, on who we are, uh, the Child Outcomes Research Consortium. Um, as Nick did reflect before, uh, we're very much a, a membership organisation. The, the work we do is all about learning from one another for building up our, our collective resources, and we really benefit from having um, uh, mental health services, but also voluntary and community sector organisations and that kind of wider, less specialist well-being, emotional support, as well as, as, as uh, schools and colleges and research bodies and, and commissions. So a really rich partnership um, and, and all committed to this vision um, that we um, are, are using evidence and, and using feedback and listening um, uh, to children and young people and thinking about their outcomes to improve that support. And really, we're all about making sure that this happens in a way that's meaningful, that's effective, that's child centres. And our kind of um, bread and butter work um, in, involves making that happen through a range of kind of tools and resources that we're, we're working with you all the time around kind of um, a best practice framework around using those outcome measures meaningfully. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Um, we we um, do training and learning events around that. We collect the routine, we collected data of members and, and we do analysis and research uh, uh, using that. I've just managed to move my picture so I can't see my own slides, so apologies. <laughs> yeah, and as well as kind of thinking about choice of measures and outcome frameworks, we also help people to do like touch evaluation so they can very much be actively evaluating and learning in context. And over recent years, we've been doing more and more with schools and have developed some systems for people and staff well-being measurement. So, so there's our kind of bread and butter. Um, and at the moment, we're excited to be in the process of kind of transitioning um, into uh, an organisation called the Anna Freud Centre, which hopefully many, many of you know. Um, and we at Cork have, have always been closely employed, us Cork staff have always been employed at the Anna Freud Centre and we sat in, in their offices. Um, and um, we in the court board have been feeling now that that formal integration and moving into the organisation walls is going to be what's going to be of most help to kind of getting that court mission achieved. As you can see, it aligns closely with, uh, meshes really well with the Anna Freud Centre's vision, which is around that kind of transforming the experience um, for children and people and their families with mental health. Um, uh, and... Um, yeah, we think that there'll be more benefits for our membership in kind of in, embedding with that broader range of expertise and initiatives in the centre that kind of spans schools and colleges, clinical services, early years, family services, and thinking about systems and policies and developing the professional workforce. So we think kind of being in that wider context um, is going to be helpful for members and for, for our work and some of the things that we're looking to achieve and having that big impact. And I think that some of the thinking around that and why that's important has really come to the fore in some collaborative work we've been involved in, which has been uh, in the Northwest in particular. Um, and this has been a series of engagements, kind of cross-sector dialogues 
um, looking at how we close the gap in child and youth mental health support. Um, I think you'll all be familiar with those big figures in the boxes from NHS Digital um, that we already knew that one in eight children and young people were, were, were experiencing a mental health difficulty before the pandemic and that during the pandemic that seemed to, to go, go up and get and worse and to be more like, like one in six. We know that of those children and young people, only quite a small proportion of them are accessing specialist help. Um, and within that, of course, there are some groups that are more likely to experience difficulties and there are other groups that find help hard to come by, that kind of social inequalities and discrimination really exacerbate those difficulties and they can undermine children and people's abilities to access help they need. Um, and as, as we've very much been at the heart of this conversation, that. We know that specialist help can't solve all the problems for everybody all the time, for any young person, they access that specialist help and about half of the time, some kind of problems do persist, they're still living with those mental health difficulties. Um, and the thinking coming out from that dialogue was very much about these kind of cross-cutting principles that we need to be um, yeah, acting on as we think about how we try and close that gap and some things that came across the board. And the, the first one was that we really need a wider range of people to be holding in mind children and young people's mental well-being. And that's not just the kind of um, professionals who have that as the first line on their job description, but that really wider sense of kind of other professionals and also family members in the wider community kind of being thoughtful about what that looks like and what's active in the frame for that. Um, as well as the fact that we really need cross-sector working to stop falling through the gaps and that it's really critical that voices of children and young people are at the heart of, at the heart of that. Um, and what does that look like for research in particular? We know that historically uh, there has been an uninvested, underinvestment in child and youth mental health research um, and that it's been difficult. There have been challenges in addressing some of the evidence gaps and some of that research knowledge really hasn't kind of uh, been actioned fully in practice and policy and that that process is slow and challenging um, to implement and also that the majority of knowledge we have is about kind of certain majority groups in society and certain types of help so we're really conscious now of how perhaps um, that those big funded studies have perhaps tended more towards medical individual based models of mental health and perhaps we've missed out on some of the opportunities that we have to understand more about kind of more community-based, more non-traditional, more early intervention supports. And that that's important to act on and perhaps also paid insufficient attention to finding out more about minoritized groups or those um, who are less likely to access mainstream services. So moving forward, this kind of gives us this kind of platform where we're thinking, yes, we need more formal research evidence. Yes, we need to get the evidence that we have out there and acted on accessible, understood and internalized by the people who need to use it. But actually, it, that middle kind of point there about how we move forward, very much at Cork's mission, that we need practice-based evidence. We need people to be generating learning from their own work in their own context. That research, which is kind of sensitive to community and led by and empowered and owned by the people who, who, are, who are in those contexts. And the more work that, that we do, the more I see how context does make a difference to what works where, and that we need to be mindful of that. And that, that kind of practice-based learning of people, which can be used and acted on so much more rapidly than the formal research studies, and can be so much more sensitive to, uh, to, the, to the place where, it's, where, where, where action and, uh, and learning are so closely combined, is really a very important part of us um, getting the best for children and young people. Um, and so I think that speaks really nicely to work Corp's involved in, of course, <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, and uh, um, a lot of it, this is gonna be discussed at the parallel sessions, but I'm gonna try not to get too pulled into any one thing, but it's that sense that a much wider range of practitioners are really stepping up to start to think actively about how they are holding young people's mental health in mind. and starting to think about how kind of measurement evidence and feedback is part of, of part of their their journey in doing that um, so some of that reflects thinking about a much wider range of, of social supports um, and um, really great to have um, Miranda here talking about Volcom's wide program and the active ingredients and I know Jenna's going to be reflecting on some of that work 
um, it, uh, with Milosh in her in her focus session. Um, but a number of those components that came out of the uh, active ingredients scoping work, many of them have been things that we more traditionally think of, like understanding your emotions, relationships, those kinds of things. But there were many important components there that perhaps are outside of that frame, like regular activities and hobbies, like looking after your body, like faith and spirituality. Um, so so we're, we're seeing a lot more and having much more opportunities to learn about those now. And one of the things which is coming out of Head Start, and many of you will have heard of that, is a strategic investment program for National Lottery um, Community Fund, which we're pleased to be on the learning team of. And actually the learning, that's kind of moving to consolidation now. So it should do watch that space for, for wider learning coming out of that program. Um, but I think what speaks to this here is some of the really interesting work which Emily and Mia are going to be talking about, which is about the kind of social support and the many different types of support young people are drawing on. So Head Start speaks to how um, young people access help from their school, from their friends, from their community and from their family and from themselves, um, additional to kind of uh, services support and professional support. So I think um, really important that we're learning about that. Um, and uh, we have also had opportunities to kind of think a bit more about how feedback and measurement um, can be useful in social care settings. Um, Lee's going to talk about um, a project we've been really pleased to be involved in, which is looking at mental health assessments in social care contexts and how we can make those more meaningful. Um, and what's come out of that is that, that using them in that setting and in those conversations, um, really coming to the fore there is about using the questionnaire tools in a really relational fashion as part of a relationship and about being curious and about their opportunity for those to be part of a shared understanding across the system so that a, a child or young person could be better understood and seen in relation to their mental health and well-being by the numerous people who interact with them in that system. So I think really important that we're learning more about feedback and evidence and how to measure in those settings. Um, given the risks that those children and people face in terms of their mental health. And still so uh, delighted to be kind of expanding and learning about this in schools as well. Um, and I'm sure that you'll have heard us talk before about the wellbeing measurement for schools approach that we've developed where, where schools can survey people, year groups and staff as well to kind of think about what their priorities are and how they're going to act and move forward as a school. Um, and what we've been really enjoying recently is, is using that kind of feedback and evidence approach in kind of wider units and the opportunities that's opening up. So we're really pleased to be working um, on the island of Jersey, um, where with the Anna Freud Centre and with Jersey Schools and with the government of Jersey, we're looking across the board about how we can kind of use evidence and feedback as part of a whole school approach. And in schools, there's that opportunity to bring together the kind of universal, the early intervention, pathways to additional support, and kind of thinking about, well, how are we using measurement to help us prioritize and monitor what's happening and be active learners in that context? Um, also really excited to be involved in Be Well, which is um, uh, so, sort of put it, uh, running across Greater Manchester, supported by uh, the GMCA, the University of Manchester. And what uh, ex is exciting there um, is about kind of um, very much thinking about, it's a very much a youth-led youth, um, um, initiative. Um, and uh, it's about kind of making well-being everybody's business. So what that program is doing is it, it's very much co-designed -de co and they've put a lot of attention to mobilizing a big coalition of partners and bringing together a lot of kind of neighborhood actors. So it's about a school-based approach and it's about surveying young people, but it's very much about a global conversation in those neighborhoods. So again, kind of everybody having, being able to hold that mental health and emotional well-being in mind. So really enjoying that as well. Um, oh, and um, uh, so one of the nice things about Cork, obviously, we're very keen always that people's learning is collated and brought together and routinely joined up. So um, we have been really enjoying how all of the work we've been doing with individual schools who've been doing school surveys and pupil surveys is starting to kind of collate and how we're starting to get a bit of a picture. So I thought that I would share with you our latest 
collated picture from our staff wellbeing surveys. Um, so we've now done these surveys with, um, I think it's uh, 7,000 staff. And here you can see kind of the um, headlines of what's been coming up there, which we just thought might be of interest. So this isn't kind of um, weighted to take into account geographical considerations and things that will be clustering around certain areas which are doing more of this kind of surveys. And we haven't looked in depth about what types of schools are more configured. So, you know, from a research perspective, definitely hold that in mind. But I think it's really interesting to have a look at it and whether or not, you know, you'd have expected these kinds of figures that kind of, I suppose, we see 59% of teachers do feel confident to support children and people with their mental health, but of course, 40% then, then are not feeling so confident. Um, so that's something that we can really, really work with and, and do more on perhaps. Uh, and another thing which has been interesting is that the data that came through kind of last year and the year before, small sample sizes, of course, um, was actually moderately consistent. So the pandemic hasn't had a huge impact on what staff are telling us in surveys. But the one thing we have seen is that in these kind of number two there, the biggest causes of stress, I'm sorry if it's a bit small, but one which is up third in this survey is pastoral concerns relating to pupils, um, whereas previously, it was more around kind of um, issues of accountability. So that's something which is shifting in this data. And I know that Melissa's presentation, um, which is uh, looking at the work that, that's been done um, on, on trying to learn about the evidence of the pandemic and the impact that it's had on people is going to kind of open that, will open that much more, how the pandemic has and hasn't changed things. And um, so do dip into that afterwards if, if you don't get to go to that presentation. Um, uh, so learning from routine data is, is exciting. And I also wanted to share with you today, uh, just so I was trying to put in a few tidbits about how we're using court memberships data and how the collated data that members share with us is being used for research and some of the kind of interesting thought provoking things that are coming out of that, I hope. So I just wanted to share this one um, piece and encourage you to keep an eye on our newsletters and keep an eye on our website to keep watching for emerging research. And this one is about single session attenders. I'm sure that many of you are aware of previous data that we generated, which kind of um, shows how, how much single session attendance is a feature of, of, of children and people's engagement with specialist mental health services. And indeed the modal level, modal number of contacts that they do have is one. So it's really important that we're thoughtful about kind of who, what, what, what's involved in those single sessions. So we did a piece of work to look at the characteristics of people who were attending for just one session um, so that we could think more about, well, to help people think more about whether those single sessions are meeting their needs. So that article shows that if you're attending for just one session, you're, you're more likely to be, to be younger, to be black or have your ethnicity not stated, to have peer relation difficulty, difficulties or low frequency problems, or to have more complexity factors. So I think that's quite thought provoking and I would encourage people to go away and think about whether or not that reflects the situation in, in your service. And I so know some of the dialogues that we've already had with services around this have really prompted that thinking around. In some cases, those single session attenders maybe don't need more support and it's exactly the right thing for them. And are we, you know, are we arranging that single session to maximize the experience and benefits that they draw from that, that one contact? And are there some other young people who are coming for one session because perhaps they can't sustain engagement for more sessions? And are we being thoughtful about that and understanding what most helps them? Uh, and one other piece I wanted to highlight was some analysis that we've done based on our uh, kind of newer, bigger merged data set at Cork, um, which Jenna shared with people at the Spring Forum. And I think it's interesting because it speaks to some of the, uh, it speaks to Miranda's decisions around uh, defining the measures that are used. And this is about the uh, average rates of improvement that we see against different questionnaires. So, after we kind of take into account the measurement error for each questionnaire, and I know you can't read that bar chart, but what I'm hoping you can see is how that green bit, which is the percentage of young people who reliably improved, kind of varies down the lines. And that, that's us seeing that for, for a different questionnaire, um, a very different number of, of young people uh, tend to be found to have improved. So if we take, for example, uh, after um, goal achievement, um, 
the most improvements seen in this data set when young people respond to IP course. So that's a generic measure of psychological distress. And we see 38% of young people who improve that, who complete that, see a reliable improvement. And in contrast, in this data set for the SDQ emotional subscale, we're seeing that only 13% of, of, of reliable improvement. So we've had some really interesting discussions around this. And one of the things that we think is helpful to bear in mind coming out of that, and thanks very much to Avon and Wilkshire and those who others who contributed to that conversation, is being really thoughtful about the questions that are in the questionnaire and really thinking, are these reflecting what's going on for the child or young person who's visiting your service? And are they reflecting the changes that you're intending to work on? And is this kind of the, the improvement that you're looking to see or that you're seeing in your service uh, reflective of that? But what we're doing now with this is we're going to develop some resources so that people can very easily access and think about the reliable improvement rate for the met that tends to be common for a measure that they're using. So that rather than using that blunt tool of what improvement might look like across the board, you can think much more um, uh, kind of closely about the measurement tool that you're using, why you're using it and what it speaks to in your service. And I guess, yeah, not wanting to, I was very keen to get into dialogue with Miranda about choice of measures. And I guess for me, it's so important that the measure uh, is meaningful to the person who's completing it and to the work that's being done. And of course, working in a much wider range of contexts than uh, mental health disorder around anxiety and depression and thinking about much wider range of issues. Um, I kind of see um, how important it is for us to kind of actively engage with the measurement tools that, that we're using and keep thinking about this. So um, watch this space for the, uh, those kind of resources to see reliable improvement rates for measures you're using. And also watch this space for learning coming out of the NHAC discovery project. Hopefully this is a real opportunity for us to kind of support that step change and really use those projects to find the tools which can, can really kind of help ease those pressures and pains, which can make it so tricky in a system to be capturing and learning from this information. Also look out for really pleased that HEE have decided to support an e-learning um, which is kind of bringing to life the guidance that we did on implementing routine outcome monitoring and specialist natal, uh, perinatal mental health services. So look out for that. And we're doing some work um, with people who are kindly stepping forward to contribute and, and share their thinking and learning um, on doing some new guidance on measuring outcomes for children and people with eating disorders. We get a lot of queries and questions about this um, and we feel like... Uh, what we've got isn't quite there or doesn't quite reflect all of the insight and knowledge that we could bring to bear on this. So we just want to kind of do some work to bring that to do, to put something really thoughtful together, which really speaks to that group and really helps practitioners working there. So contribute to the advisory group if you haven't already had an opportunity to do so, if you've got something to say on that. And we're actually going to be doing some other um, some other ones that think about measures in specific contexts or with specific groups of children and young people. So um, I hope people will engage with them. I think we're particularly interested on measurement tools in culture as well. Um, and uh, I can't remember what the others, we've got a bit of a timetable. So um, okay, stay, up, stay on to that. Um, and uh, yes, also I suppose just to say that as we move into the Unemployed Centre, we really want to use that opportunity to enrich our support. And of course, generally, we want court to be more vibrant than ever. So um, we will be kind of reaching out and trying to engage with, with the members in the network a bit more to make sure that we've got a really good understanding of what supports you, what you value, what you need more of. Um, so hopefully you'll be happy to dialogue with us on that. Um, OK, I think that's me. I've been asked whenever I open my mouth by Martha to also encourage people to fill in the feedback form. So please, please honour our desire to be a learning organisation. And I think at various points that's being dropped into the chat and it will come again in an email afterwards. I think it's just it's not a big thing, um, but it really helps us if, if you can. Um, OK, that's me. Back to you, Nick. Thanks, Kate. Um, and so, lots and lots of people to take in there and great that Bill some of those subjects will be explored in a bit more detail in the parallel sessions. And if, if there's something that piqued your interest and it's not the parallel session that you've opted to be part of, we are recording those parallel sessions and we'll be sharing slides 
so you don't have to miss out. So thanks very much, Kate. We can go straight into questions. There's been lots going on in the chat while you were talking. Um, so um, if Louise and Ari, welcome back. Um, I'm going to kick off with a question that came through at the um, Louise and Ari. I'm actually going to push a few questions together. Um, there was a lot of interest, Louise and Ari, in the, in the discovery project and um, various questions around basically how can people find out more? What are they allowed to know at this time? Um, particular interest in the um, involvement of the voluntary sector and who's doing that, which regions are doing what. Could you um, let us know when people will be able to know more, what they're allowed to know at the moment? So, um, yeah, it feels um, really artificial to explain a brilliant um, funding of um, outcomes projects and then not share the details. So I'm, I'm very happy to put together a list of the organisations that are involved. And as I said, they're at different levels. So some are provider levels. So um, absolutely right, Wendy, um, Mersey Care is... Um, involved in the Northwest Regions project, but in other areas, it's a kind of a higher level collection of sort of health system wide. But I will give that list to you, Nick and Martha, to share um, along with other pieces that you're sharing after the um, event. Um, we, it's quite quite a crammed program for the um, projects themselves so it's a kind of sprint 12 weeks you know lots of um, expert input so whilst there'll be internal show and tell so kind of internal learning for those actually involved in the project um, there um, I'm now thinking that we need to think about how we get some information back out as the 12 weeks progress there'll be lots of feedback and learnings and um opportunities to share the output at the end of the 12 weeks but it, it's just raised the questions have raised a good point for us that we need to kind of um describe progress through the 12 weeks and maybe nick and sally that's something that we can talk with you so list out to everyone i'll think of a way of sharing progress but at the 12 weeks after the end of march there will be formal opportunities to understand how the projects have progressed, but we've, we've got to give the project teams an opportunity to, to get on with the work first. Does that Absolutely. answer the question, Nick? I think that does answer the question, and yet yeah, we can share that. We're also going to feature it in our newsletter. If you're not signed up to our newsletter, um, do that. And, and Sally and I can share those updates as the um, project develops. So I can, I'm now going to go to a question from the floor. Um, Holly has her hand up. Hi, Holly. Do you want to unmute and ask your question? Hi, yeah, um, I was it was just a question posed to Kate, I suppose. Um, so working in sort of quite a, um, I work in a pupil referral unit and the adjoined APs, um, and we, you know, can, it's, it's really positive to hear that you're considering the, you know, the less mainstream settings and how those things are going to be more widely represented uh, in research moving forward. I think that's really promising. Um, the one thing that really um, I wanted to touch on is that you um, you spoke about, you know, considering how well the measures reflect the demographic of students. But actually, I think sometimes it's about um, who's delivering perhaps the interventions as well. So and, and this reflects as well with, with what you were saying about the single sessions and actually that there were, um, you know, a high number of black or ethnicity not stated persons, you know, uh, within that demographic. And I do wonder if it's um, if you had well, if there was any comment perhaps you could make on perhaps the representation around that. And, um, you know, obviously there's there's information and knowledge that we don't know. But I wonder if it's important to recognise that that is something that is um, is needed. And, and, you know, that wider representation, especially in schools when there are where there are um, such low numbers of, uh, you know, global majority staff in general across the you know across the board it is mostly you know uh white white staff you know as we've as we've found in recent um you know studies i, I yeah i think it would just be interesting to hear from your point of view what that can what could that could mean i think it's a really important point but um i i think that you're right that we haven't got a great deal of actual evidence to support our understanding of the relationship between that person delivering and that experience and the impact 
of what's delivered. And I think, unfortunately, we don't have that richness in the court data set specifically, so we can't uh, inquire into that. So I think it's definitely a question for future studies. I know we're super conscious ourselves as a body of researchers, and there was some evidence generally about researchers in the national papers the other day about how that struggles with representativeness and um, we're actively working on that and thinking about involving in terms of things in our work. So I think it's absolutely um, in, in, in the minds of people and that you raise something which is we're increasingly aware of and, and need to be increasingly attentive to. And I mean, we're refreshing the court research strategy at, as we speak and are always really keen to hear from members and people about what they think um, is key. And I think that, you know, that's something for us to be thinking about that we need perhaps more research evidence um, to reinforce our understanding of that. Um, Julian, I see as my research, one of my co-research colleagues that you've got your hand up, so uh, please add. Thank you. Um, no, thank you both. This is a really important question. Um, so we uh, did a piece of work um, where we cons were consulting with diverse groups of young people. Um, and this was really about how we can better support young people with multiple needs. Um, and a really interesting um, uh, take on this uh, came out was that actually if we are working with young people in a person-centered way, so if we are support, you know, we're, we're working with a young person to understand them um, and to meet their needs in the ways that they want their needs to be met. Actually, this, just by doing that, that's a really important step towards um, uh, 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 tackling um, uh, uh, inequalities um, because, because we all have different identities and our identities uh, will cover a range of areas. Um, if we can kind of shift our the way we're doing our services so it's not about what our services are able to provide but actually you know how we can best meet an individual's different needs um, uh, this is a kind of as well as increasing uh, diversity in the workforce this is another way um, into helping you know uh, making sure uh, people with different identities from diverse groups are best supported um, and yeah going on to Kate's point you know we know this is a massive um, a massive issue um, in, in, in research um, and I think it's an issue um, uh, uh, about ethnicity about um, accessibility um, about um, anti-classism um, so yeah, uh, we're obviously thinking about what we can do in our own uh, work, but also how we can contribute in a helpful way to, you know, the wider systems changes that are needed around this. Um, and we've recently completed our first researcher internship scheme, uh, which was a paid internship for uh, individuals from black and minoritized ethnic groups who wouldn't otherwise be able to take part in an um, unpaid internship. Um, we've been really pleased with how this how this went, and it's something we're going to be expanding, um, and indeed uh, expanding to these other other groups uh, that I was uh, just mentioning. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think it's a really important uh, point. Thank you. Thanks, Julian. Thanks, Julian. Sorry, I lost my unmute button there. Um, it's uh, our Q and A session has gone very quickly, but I, I was very excited when scrolling through the chat to find questions. How many people have stepped in to respond to questions? So I think it really shows the level of expertise there is in the room. And I think my concern with virtual events is people don't have the opportunity to chat, but they do. And people have been talking to each other, sharing things that are going on um, and from all sorts of different people. So um, if you didn't see this in the chat, we will save it and we, we'll share that with you as part of the, as, of the follow up that comes around. And you can see where those questions were asked and answered. So we are going to pause for a, for a, a 20 minute break now before we go into our parallel session. So thank you. Um, to our, our panel and thank you to those of you who ask questions if there are questions that haven't been answered we'll include answers to those as far as we can so there might be a couple that we missed if you've got further questions drop them in the chat and we'll do our very best 
to include those answers either when we put stuff on the website or when we circulate things to you afterwards. So um, I'm going to remind you again that um, we know sometimes people have to have to leave partway through the morning. And um, so if